My name is uh, Thomas Wright. I'm a uh, freshman in the School of Computer Science. Um, this sort of ties in with her earlier question. How do you feel about uh, the open software or the open source software project, and what are some of your personal experiences in that? Well, clearly there's been free software. You know, all, there's always been free software. There always will be free software. And the, the great thing about all marketplaces is you get this dynamic uh, where you know, somebody wants to go off and start a company and pay salaries for people. That's a good thing. They pay taxes, create jobs. Uh, and so that software, they have to make it better than what it's ever free and be able to charge for that. You know, hopefully the people who use whatever great work they do Every once in a while, we'll pay them so they can uh, pay their salaries. And then at the same time, you have things that are done for free. You know, the original Unix system done out of Bell Labs was a, a free piece of software. And everybody you know, looked at that, benefited from that. Uh, there's various descendants of that that are used. The original browser, uh, University of Illinois piece of work, was a free piece of software. Now, that never got much usage because it was a small scale team that did it. It was actually more larger projects that came along later that actually moved that thing forward. So you have a very positive dynamic. It's a market type system uh, where depending on the category of software, you'll either have the really expensive stuff, the mid expensive stuff, the cheap stuff, or the free stuff will have different uh, shares. You know, if you go to a corporation and look at the database they use, they typically use a fairly expensive piece of software for that. If you go and look at consumers, and then you get more down to the lower end. So it's a very healthy dynamic. I do think that in time, you, there won't, it won't tilt in the sense I do think that there will be jobs working as a software person, uh, which will be supported by uh, the commercial element that is part of this dynamic mix. Hello. Hello. I'm Paul, a uh, sophomore chemistry major and Gates Millennium Scholar, which actually leads me to my question. Uh, how do you go about, you and Melinda, of course, and also um, Mr. Hellman, go about deciding like where and how much time to dedicate to the philanthropies that you do? Because there's a lot of causes out there, but at the same time, you can't do everything all the time. No, that's an excellent question. and. It's a troubling question, because when you first get into philanthropy and people know that you might write some checks, uh, there's no shortage of stories from you know, individuals who are kind of down on their luck, who just you know, a small loan would uh, be unbelievable, uh, out to very, very tough problems. And you know, in, certain, in terms of magnitude, that's pretty simple. You take what ever you think is appropriate for your, your kids to have, which uh, certainly in my case is a percentage, is very small. Uh, they haven't voted on that, but they won't get to vote on it. Uh, uh, they may feel a little, it's a little too small, but oh well. Uh, and then the rest of it, you want to give back to society uh, to have the, the greatest possible impact. And if you look at the world at large and say, okay, what what, cause, what global cause should you pick? You know, I can give you how I end up picking uh, global health and empowering the poor is the primary thing our foundation goes after. If you go back to the 1960s, uh, the world was characterized by very few rich countries that represented less than a third of the world, and then the rest were very poor countries. And there were almost none in the middle. China was very poor, India was very poor, uh, you know, everybody but parts of Europe, uh, starting Japan, and Western Europe, uh, Japan, the US, Canada, Australia. And then if you move forward to the year, say, 2000, uh, it was very different, where you had about two thirds of the world was doing pretty well. It was clearly on a positive cycle without special help, that the virtue of the more educated you get, the more stable your society is, the more you're, you're doing uh, good products. You know, countries like Brazil and Mexico that back in 1960 were undistinguished from, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, actually poorer in both cases than most of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, they had moved up in a dramatic way. China is the most dramatic of all. 
uh, because of the reforms that actually didn't start until 1979. But it's the greatest creation of wealth the world has ever seen, and reduction. And it's not just economic. It's, uh, you know, in the 1960s, uh, over 20 million children died every year. Uh, children under five died. Uh, most recently, uh, last year, that number's down to 8.8 .8 million. And so how do we go, when the births have gone up a lot, because the population's higher, it's gone up a lot, how do we more than reduce those deaths by a factor two? It's only two things. One is, as you get wealthier, your food, your lifestyle, your shelter is just better, uh, and so you're less subject to disease. And the second is the miracle of, of vaccines that have come in for something like measles and, and cured all those lives. So seeing... You know, my view in philanthropy is if you don't know any example where something's worked, then, uh, wow, you were in uncharted territory. You knew a few of those, uh, but it's better to pick a paradigm that's, that's been successful and see how you can catalyze more of that. And in the case of uh, these poor countries, what happened that, that graduated and became part of the rich countries is a mixture of good health, uh, uh, literacy and reduction in population growth. And the strongest connection is as you improve health, it reduces population growth, which, it, and it, it increased literacy. Now, when I first saw that, that was a paradox because you think, well, if you make people healthier, then you get more people, right? Because you're avoiding death. So the answer is very quickly, in less than half a generation, uh, parents adjust, that is the fertility, they drop the fertility rate to more than compensate, way more than compensate for the uh, improvement in health. And it's actually well understood now that what's going on is that in a household, you're having enough kids that even given the uncertainty of health, that you're going to have two to three survive to be an adult. And so the more health problems you have, the more you have to get this large number just to have the insurance of having the high probability of having somebody to take care of you because you don't have Social Security or anything. And that is why health is so catalytic. Anyway, um, uh, and so I, you know, I decided, okay, we'll go do health because you can save lives in global health. You can spend less than $1,000 and you can save a life. Uh, you know, airbags, for example, very good thing. Uh, in that case, you spend $10 million, you save a life. Uh, you know, so it's good, we should do that, but the lives saved in that technique are, you, you know, it's costing you 10,000 times as much. That is, if you didn't spend that money to save that one life, you could save 10,000 lives because these vaccines aren't being produced and provided. But, you know, that hopefully will, will get fixed. So that, you know, I, in my case, I pick health uh, and helping the poor as the global problem. And then I decided to pick one problem, uh, and this was with my wife, Melinda, uh, totally. Uh, one problem that was in the United States, which had created the environment that allowed the, the wealth to be created, and that was education. And that's where the online learning and measuring teachers and scholarships, uh, those things come out of saying, okay, what, what one thing, if you could help it even a little bit, would make the future of this country better than any other problem you could work on in, in education. With it, we've had a particular emphasis particular emphasis on high school education is, is what we've chosen. So that's a long answer to uh, how you decide to spend $30 billion. In case any of us need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you have that problem. Uh... Uh, hi. Well, Warren Buffett had the same problem, but yeah, he, he made me do it. <laughs>